The other thing that the pre- left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is exquisitely positioned to do, and this is um, beautiful work of a colleague of mine by the name of Nolan Williams, also in psychiatry, is because of its connections to some structures that then feed into the vagus nerve, it actually can slow the heart rate down. So in other words, let's say someone says something and your immediate impulse is to fight or uh, to respond in a kind of knee-jerk way. If you halt, right, I guess what the meditators and the mindfulness folks was called the gap, or if you can access some memory and think, ah, and, and you might be thinking, you know, actually there's a much better way to place the dart if I just kind of lean back a little bit, or it could be, you know, silence might be the best response, right? Um, mm-hmm. Or it could be that you're going to carefully access uh, some data from your hippocampus to respond in a way that is most effective. Uh, for instance, here I'm talking about confrontation, but it could be any situation. The left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does two things. As it acquires a new rule set or starts to access information about a new or possible rule set, it also sends a parallel signal to slow the heart down through the vagus nerve. And that is, I think, one of the more important and fascinating discoveries in the last five years. That is, those aren't data from my laboratory. I wish they were. But it's very clear that when we start accessing alternate rule sets, there's a signal that quiets the body in some way and position. Is that partly how you calm yourself down? That's right. It is how you calm yourself down. And again, uh, you have the clinical background, not I, but um, I, I'll confess I've, I've been in therapy enough to know that occasionally, you know, one feels as if you're accessing some piece of, inf- as the patient side, I can only report from the patient side, you know, re- mm-hmm. accessing some, what feels like important piece of information, you're pulling on a thread of some sort, but then the therapist will say something and it, it literally gives you that alternate view. And this notion of looking at things through a different perspective, we often think about that as a switch in our cognitive frame, in our, in our thinking, but also we now know there's this parallel signal that's sent to the body in which in order to access these alternate rule sets, new ways of looking at things, there's a calming signal literally sent to the body as well. And I find this conversation fascinating because normally we just think about anxiety and exploration and rule setting and rule responses or responses to rules, etc. as a kind of a, the body sends signals and the brain does all this, what neuroscientists have always talked about as top-down processing right? Just sort of suppress the hypothalamus, control the limbic system. Right, right. And that's true to some extent, but there's also, it's clear there are signals being sent to the body in parallel. And rather than look at the signals... It's more like conducting than suppressing. Exactly. Like conducting, like an orchestra, orchestrator conducts. E- exactly. And there's a very interesting phenomenon that takes place in people that have chronic anxiety or for people who essentially stop accessing alternate rules and responses to these signals. And this is, I think, what is showing up in chronic anxiety, certainly in certain forms of depression, and when people enter states of rage and dysregulation, is that normally we know based on neuroimaging that the prefrontal cortex is essentially leading the response of of this anterior cingulate cortex in the insula. So information is coming up from the body into the insula and then being fed to the prefrontal cortex. But then the prefrontal cortex is actually in a position to lead responses. And it essentially is acting like the coach of a team. And the team is all these structures like the ACC and the the anterior cingulate Mm -hmm. cortex and the insula, the heart rate and so forth. Mm -hmm. What happens in individuals who have chronic anxiety or damage to the prefrontal cortex or dysregulation of these circuitries is that that order actually reverses the insula and ACC start leading and directing the response of the prefrontal cortex. And I think, you know, we see this in, I'm sure you've seen this clinically in individuals. And um, while this isn't necessarily a discussion about society at large, I mean, we see this in dysregulated arguments and dysregulated combat where people is essentially um, losing themselves and they default to one, what appears to be very primitive rule set. And it may or may not be the appropriate one, but you and I, of course, have the good fortune of knowing a number of people who've worked in special operations and things like that. And you talk to any of those individuals and they know from experience and from training that their ability to access multiple rule sets and options in the moments of extreme autonomic arousal is actually where their power lies, right? It's the, or or a combat fighter, or let's just take, or in debate, right? Something that you're far more versed in than I am, right? Although I guess every academic has to deal with a bit of that coming up, the thesis defense, et cetera. In a really good debate, you can't allow the autonomic response to overtake you 
or you lose access to an enormous database that resides in your one's hippocampus and you essentially one then defaults to the the bodily state right and this is what we see when we see people become dysregulated in rage etc so if we were to zoom out and then ask you know where is the line between exploration and anxiety i think that we can um check off a few boxes for sure first of all that autonomic arousal this this tendency to be more alert or more in action than in non-action is a very healthy response i mean the moment adrenaline is released from the adrenals and and as you know there's a parallel signal in the brain you know you get adrenaline released from the adrenals if you get in a cold shower or somebody says something triggering or you are afraid of heights or something but the brain has its own kind of adrenaline system which is this structure in the back of the brain called locus ceruleus and it basically has a it essentially sprinklers the entire brain with noradrenaline and adrenaline it's a very interesting system it is lacks specificity it basically wakes up the whole brain if you were to, if i were to put a little mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. if i were to label the connections of the locus ceruleus it's basically connected to everything it just kind of sprinkles a caffeine like substance on the entire brain wakes you up the adrenals in the body wake up the body so two parallel systems wake us up Is that associated with the orienting reflex? Yes. If you orient, does the locus ceruleus wake up the brain? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So it's a key component of the retic- so-called reticular activating system. Reticular activating system. Yeah. Yep. And and incidentally, I I should mention this um, because uh, I was going to come to this later, but I think it's relevant now. If somebody has a lesion in their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or if you transiently inactivate it with a, t- a technology, a non-invasive technology like transcranial magnetic stimulation, they can now just put a magnet on a, outside the skull and quiet that area of the brain transiently. In animals or humans, what you find is that that person or human becomes incredibly accurate at any motor task. So for instance, if I um, uh, were to give you a shooter game where you're supposed to shoot targets and, I, and you're shooting targets, you'll have some, some hits and some misses like anybody. Um, if I inactivate your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, your accuracy goes through the roof. It's near 100%. But the one thing you can't do is decide whether or not you're shooting an enemy or a uh, or a friend. So you can no longer establish rules. You just become very good at execution of the motor behavior. Similarly in an animal or person mm-hmm. without a dorsolateral prefrontal well, cortex. You see a trade-off there, right, between between specificity and and flexibility. That's right. And so and so we see this theme over and over again where as a purely you know sensory motor response machine the prefrontal cortex isn't even necessary. In fact, if you get rid of it entirely, people become like machines. If I click over here, somebody has no prefrontal cortex, basically everything becomes a stimulus. A puppy, everything's a stimulus. You know, I used to have a bulldog when he was a puppy, he had to worry about leaving cords out and everything was went into his mouth. By the time he was, you know, a mm-hmm. year old, in part because he was a bulldog, he just kind of lay there. Like you could put a, a toy in front of him and he wasn't into playing and just leave it alone. A baby, everything's a stimulus. Many adults become mm-hmm. infant-like in their responses, right, when ang- anxiety is high. In fact, I have a friend who's a psychologist. Tell me if you agree with this statement or not, that anxiety makes children of us all. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Um, Certainly has been my experience that when feeling anxious, I don't struggle with chronic anxiety, but it certainly feel like have felt anxiety. Well, it simplifies us. I mean, all these underlying emotions and motivational states, these primordial instincts are simplification mechanisms. And so if we're unable to compute a complex and sophisticated pathway forward that takes multiple variables into account simultaneously, we can't just do nothing. We're going to default to a more primordial and direct state and then you might say the whole panoply of emotions and motivations lies there at the weight for us to grip our behavior if we're what would you say if we're paralyzed by inability to choose between multiple options and so we do to the degree that we're simplified by an emotion then we're reduced to something more approximating an infantile state if you watch two year olds and two year olds are particularly interesting in this regard they basically just cycle through innate motivational states it makes them really interesting to be around because when they're in, interested in something they're 100% interested in it and then when they're angry they're 100% angry and if they're anxious they're 100% a- anxious and they can and tired they just instantly fall into a coma and they just cycle through these with no overarching centralized integration and it's partly because they likely don't really manifest any 
integrating prefrontal cortical capacity until they hit about three, where they can start to engage in joint play states with other children, right? And then they can exercise, then they can, they can modulate their underlying emotions in accordance with an abstract representation or goal, sometimes that's jointly shared. That's part of developing sophistication. It's also why the idea that identity is subjectively defined is absolutely preposterous. It's like, it's subjectively defined for two-year-olds, but it's not sub subjectively defined for anyone who's sophisticated enough to negotiate with someone else. <laughs>